I first met Kenneth Arrow in 1972, the year he won the Nobel Prize. He was a professor at Harvard. I was a graduate student at Yale. My thesis advisor was Herb Scarf, who had been colleagues with Kenneth here at Stanford uh, in the late 50s and early uh, 60s. Herb introduced us, and I went up to Cambridge uh, to talk to Kenneth Arrow. Well, I was in awe, not knowing what to expect. Uh, and when I got there, mostly what he wanted to talk about was my work. And he was encouraging and helpful, and uh, we hit it off very well. Uh, little did I know then, we would be colleagues for the next 45 years, um, including the summers he spent at Stanford in the 1970s, and then he joined the Stan rejoined the Stanford faculty in 1979. About uh, seven years ago, the Stanford community asked if I would give a 30-minute talk summarizing Kenneth's career. Uh, I thought 30 minutes was totally inadequate, but I agreed to do it. And uh, I reflected on his career and the four Nobel Prizes that he easily uh, should have won. Um, I'm giving the talk, and I was slightly intimidated by Kenneth Arrow was in the front row. And so I was describing Kenneth's career uh, to Kenneth. And um, it went pretty well, actually. Uh, I think I convinced the audience that he was one of the greatest economists of the uh, 20th uh, century. But the material that I didn't cover would have made a terrific uh, career itself. This academic tribute to Kenneth has been a labor of love for me. Um, everybody we invited to be speakers, they accepted. I've never seen anything quite like it. Only one or two people had impossible conflicts but everybody wanted to be here for uh, Ken. Uh, I also want to thank Larry Kramer of the Hewlett Foundation and the president and provost of Stanford for funding this uh, great conference. Kenneth Arrow was a magnificent guy who knew something about everything, a lot about everything, and yet he was humble and friendly and kind and I certainly view him as a great friend, and I do think he belongs on the Mount Rushmore of 20th century economists. When I came to Stanford in 2005, the first person who came by my office was Ken Arrow. He said, hi, I'm Ken. I'm like, yeah, I know who you are. Uh, I want to learn more about your work on the kibbutz. So we went to lunch. Uh, of course, by then, I've heard everything about uh, how Ken knows everything about everything, but still I was amazed about how much he knew about kibbutzim and their history and politics and economics. But you know what I was even more amazed about? Here was me, a brand new assistant professor, having lunch with the most important economist of the 20th century, and he deeply cared about me and was deeply interested to learn about me and my work. He, he viewed me as his equal. Now, of course, since then, we've had many conversations. Uh, Ken was a main source of inspiration to me. Um, I would never waste a conversation with Ken talking about mundane things like the weather. You know, I would ask him things like, hey, Ken, how was it like to grow up under the Great Depression? Or uh, how did you come up with the theory of asymmetric information? To which, by the way, he had a hilarious answer. He said, you know, I was just thinking about the relationship between doctors and their patients. I had this unique talent to take any practical problem and turn it into theoretical. <laughs> and I thought, here is a genius that doesn't take himself too seriously. How refreshing. Now, one of my last memories of Ken was from about a year and a half ago. It was 8 o'clock in the evening, and I was working late in the office, and suddenly I heard this loud noise. So I ran outside, and I saw Ken. He was on the floor. He fell and had this big bump on his eye. And the first thing I was thinking was, oh, my God, uh, I really hope this is nothing serious, uh, but he's 95 years old. I better take him to the hospital as quickly as possible. But all he could talk about was how he had a flight to catch the following morning to New York City, where Claudia Goldin was about to give an Aero lecture, and he couldn't possibly miss it. So I insisted that he at least talk to his son and discuss this issue with him. And so we called his son, and they speak. And at some point, his son is like, Dad, are you also a little worried about uh, appearing like that in public with his big bump on your eyes in front of a, of a large audience? And Ken was, no, I'm not worried about that. That's not my problem. It's the audience's problem. <laughs> and right then, I knew that it was uh, nothing serious.
Uh, what an incredible man. He really feels like an end of an era. What I think makes Ken so incredible and so special goes much beyond his intellectual brilliance, which uh, you can read in his writing. It's really about his decency as a human being, his attitude, the way he approached things, this boundless curiosity and enthusiasm. He had a deep sense of what he knew and what he understood and what he didn't know and didn't understand. And he would only speak to the former and otherwise tell you that he doesn't understand something, that he wants to understand something. And that is really so genuine and quite rare in our profession, that level of engagement. Going hand in hand with that and with the, his decency as a human being was Ken's deep interest in ethics. Again, that's very rare in our profession. Most, of, uh, most economists shy away or even avoid talking about ethics directly, but Ken was not like that. He helped form a center on uh, ethics in society at Stanford, and until a few months before he passed, he still taught a course, and that was a course related to ethics with the philosopher uh, Deborah Satz. And a few days, a few weeks, sorry, before he passed, I was lucky to get a book from him that is actually entitled On Ethics and Economics, or on econ Economics and Ethics, or something like that. And this is a book with uh, conversations and interviews with Ken, and he totally shines through in that book. He meanders here and there, but there are a lot of gems. He talks about wanting to have a discourse, a, a general, uh, a, a, he talks about the general vision for a society. He talks about having a careful, logical, rational discourse as sort of the way to approach problems. That's what he wants. That's kind of the one thing he, he wishes for. Uh, and that is so missing right now. And, and he's so brilliant to kind of say that. He knows that problems are difficult. He wants to think about them. He wants people to engage with them. That's what he sees as his main uh, strength and what, what he wants to leave us. And so I think we should listen carefully to that. The world be a much better place. If more people took just that uh, out, out of Ken. The book ends with him laughing enthusiastically, and that too is what we'll remember, childlike optimism and that, that genuine smile and the sparkle in his eye. He'll be greatly missed. In spite of his uh, greatness, uh, there was nothing pompous or pretentious about uh, Kenneth. A lot of uh, the best economics of the 20th century was done while Kenneth was sitting in somebody else's office uh, uh, talking and discussing with him. Uh, as an example, let me just bring a story or tell a story that Kenneth liked to tell. He said that um, uh, uh, in, uh, in May 1st, 1961, there was the May Day Parade in Moscow, and uh, there were uh, groups of uh, soldiers and uh, uh, long missiles and uh, uh, tanks and uh, uh, jet planes screaming overhead. And uh, then uh, between uh, one of the missiles and one of the tanks, uh, there were uh, a group of 10 uh, men wearing black suits and black hats and carrying black satchels. So Khrushchev turned to the general in charge of the uh, parade and he said, who are these people? So the general said, these are economists, uh, Comrade Khrushchev. He said, economists, are you crazy? Tomorrow morning you go off to Siberia. Whereupon the general said, very well, Comrade Khrushchev, I go off to Siberia, but uh, you should know, you have no idea how much damage 10 economists can cause. Like thousands of e other economists, I first encountered Ken Arrow as a student, and later he became a treasured colleague and dear friend, something I couldn't have imagined at the time. Uh, we shared many, many interests. Um, indeed, Ken was interested and curious and knowledgeable about almost everything. Uh, we shared a particular concern and passion for public investment that passed really rigorous cost-benefit test, 
Indeed, he had helped kill the supersonic transport boondoggle uh, with a cost-benefit analysis of the Council of Economic Advisors. That and his uh, work with Mordecai Kurtz on public investment, well, theoretical work on public investment, influenced my development of investment and capital stock accounts for the federal government that OMB has now taken over and publishes annually in the budget. Ken made foundational contributions to social choice theory, general equilibrium theory, economics of risk and insurance, health economics, and many other areas. And many of these amply describe and are tremendously influential in thinking about real world important phenomenon. For example, fracking, which has really fundamentally altered world oil markets, perhaps the most important market in the world, uh, is the marginal cost has fallen 50% by learning by doing something Ken uh, uh, discussed and analyzed and drew out the implications of in the 1960s. Ken was also just a wonderful human being. Uh, he was always curious to the end. He was working on a paper when he was in the hospital the last time I saw him. He was curious about what I was doing every time I spoke with him. And I think every person he encountered, he was equally curious. That was just a lovely, lovely quality. He was a lovely man. That he will be sorely missed is uh, the, one of the great understatements of all time, both as an as a intellectual figure and as a colleague and as a friend. But more importantly, um, he leaves behind a legacy that is truly beyond remarkable. Fifteen years ago, Paul Klemper and I gave a talk on a paper we just published about the value of an extra bidder in an auction. Ken was there. The first half of the talk about private values went fine. The second half, extending the analysis to common values, Ken questioned whether the key assumption was reasonable. At first, after the seminar, we were pretty confident. We were in our 40s, he was 80. We thought about the problem for a year, he thought about it for an hour. But then we thought about it some more, and later, some more, and, well, you can guess the rest. Since I met Kenneth Arrow in the very late 70s, I had great pleasure, enjoyment, discussing with him, having lunch with him, meeting his family, Selma. It has always been a real pleasure being with him, real pleasure. Uh, more recently, in the last year or so, when I was at Stanford, I had also the pleasure of seeing him every week or two weeks, which was a real treat, and discussing. One discussion that came up as notable was when I explained the recent results between quantum theory and Arrow's impossibility theorem that I had found. And he immediately said he understood this was possible because he had heard years ago about the connection between the impossibility theorem that he had proven and Kurt Gödel's incompleteness of mathematics. And he asked me if I could go back and prove directly, not just quantum theory, Kurt Gödel's impossibility and Addo's impossibility theorem, but just those two. He wanted and he sent me as a homework to do directly the connection between Kurt Gödel's impossibility theorem, or rather incompleteness of mathematics, and Arrow's impossibility theorem. This was very recent. This was about a year ago. Very, very sharp. I've been thinking about it. I have been able to do it three ways with quantum theory, but not directly as he wanted. The other notable uh, comment that I had from him was in the last few weeks of his life, when he already had to go to hospital because of the pneumonia, and he um, then asked me to fetch under his computer for a yellow pad that had notes of his most recent article that he actually never finished on the importance of general equilibrium theory. So at the last minute, he was working, trying to understand the importance and explain the importance of general equilibrium theory to economics as a whole. This is just the, to explain the intellectual pleasure that you 
I derived, and just I think everybody derived, from contact with him and the loss to all of us, in fact, to everybody, to the world that we have. The things I'd like to say about Ken Arrow have to do, I would say, more with his kindness and help to others than with his overall genius and expertise in so many different matters. In my time, I had occasion to write some book reviews. These were fairly recent. And they had to do with economics, and which is not exactly my field. So I decided that it would be a good idea to run some of my ideas past Ken. And we had lunch together, and he very graciously pointed things out to me that uh, I needed to know about, and I felt uh, very much better for having had that experience. Well, that happened twice. Another thing I want to uh, mention is that I recently completed a book, which is now published, and in this book there comes up the subject of shadow prices. Now, shadow prices are something uh, in linear programming that uh, are, the term is usually attributed to Paul Samuelson. And I asked Ken if, if he thought that was really correct. And almost instantly, he said, he thinks that it goes back to J.R. Hicks about 10 years before Samuelson actually used the term in publication. And so that little bit of information got included in the book and uh, I was quite grateful for it. Apart from that, um, I had the pleasure of working with Ken uh, years ago on a kind of fest shrift in honor of Jerry Lieberman. And so the two of us, along with two other people, were co-editors, and that was a very nice experience. I'm sure many of you uh, are fully aware of, uh, of Kenneth's brilliance, passion for learning, uh, in many domains of knowledge, his kindness, his humanity, his modesty, his humility. Uh, uh, to all of these I can give personal te testimony uh, from my own experience, but it will add, add little uh, to what uh, is widely known and appreciated. There is another special quality that Kenneth himself w uh, was conscious of, uh, his affirmative skepticism. And I want to explain that uh, self-contradictory disposition, which I came to recognize from the very beginning of my experience uh, with him uh, after I joined the department in 1961. Uh, and I think we'll recall for, for many uh, uh, what it uh, was like to have a conversation with Professor Arrow. Uh, in which uh, he proposed a striking interpretation or an explanation uh, of an economic or social phenomena or something you know, which you uh, uh, brought up, uh, uh, having been studying it for a while. Uh, and while you were trying to grasp the significance of his idea, uh, he paused and began to suggest uh, that there might be something wrong with it. And before you could register that qualification, he was offering you second thoughts about his, f his first uh, second thought. Uh, this quality uh, of affirmative uh, skepticism was not critical uh, in its intent. It was an expression uh, of the genius uh, of, 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 of a person who could carry two contradict your ideas uh, and still continue uh, to function beyond the normal range of human c capabilities. It is um, uh, something which was first noted as a mark of genius in a short story, to my knowledge, by F. Scott Fitzgerald called The Crack Up, which I recommend to you. Two other people who displayed this uh, come to mind. Uh, the first was Adam Smith who harbored both the idea that a competitive price system would lead 
uh, to a coherent uh, allocation of resources, uh, which in, in some ways satisfy uh, the needs of a population, and at the same time recognized that uh, comp competitive conditions uh, uh, which were not uh, compatible with the increasing returns to scale and learning from knowledge uh, uh, did not uh, contain the ultimate sources of driving economic growth. The other genius of this kind who mixed two explanatory uh, principles uh, was Darwin, uh, who combined uh, the ancient idea uh, of antecedents, uh, that everything that could emerge was already present in the gene pool, because most of the mutations were in the gene pool, but at the same time, the selection uh, of what uh, could have inclusive fitness uh, depended upon not looking back, but looking forward. In both cases, uh, these geniuses uh, created a structure with lasting importance, and that, I think, is true of Kenneth's work. I came to Stanford in 1984 to work with Amos Tversky in the IMSSS program. But when I arrived, Tversky was already on leave, and I was assigned Ken Arrow as my advisor in his place. Now, I'd known of Ken's work in social choice theory and the impossibility theorem, but I'd never before studied any economics. Before my first meeting with Ken, I was browsing through the course catalog and saw a course by another professor titled General Equilibrium Theory. Curious, I asked Ken if he knew anything about what was taught in that course. He very patiently explained to me the content of the course without ever revealing his role in the development of the theory. He did, though, make it sound magical. As a result, I ended up taking the class, falling in love with economics, and switching my PhD program. I also soon learned how foolish my question Tim had been and what a humble and amazing man he was. So everybody knows Ken's contributions to economic theory. What I wanted to point out is that Ken also cared a great deal about applications of microeconomic analysis. And at times, his involvement with applications was extremely impactful as well. I'm thinking in particular about his involvement with one of the biggest global health issues, malaria. A key challenge in the war against malaria is that of drug resistance. Every decade or so, a new medicine appears but it is quickly rendered useless because the parasite becomes resistant to the drug. So in the early 2000s, Ken chaired a National Institute of Medicine um, committee, and they wrote a report that made a very clear recommendation. International organizations and world leaders should jointly contribute 300 million to 500 million um, annually to create a global subsidy that would bring down the price of combination treatments down to about 10 cents per treatment course. 10 cents was the price of the old medicine. The idea was that the combination treatment is much harder for the parasites to become resistant to. And so by subsidizing those and making sure that malaria sufferers take the combination therapy instead of the old medicine, we could both save lives and at the same time slow down the development of resistance. And this is exactly what happened. Because Ken was so influential and his recommendation was so right, such a global subsidy scheme was set up in 2010 and hundreds of thousands of lives were saved as a result. And resistance to artemisinin uh, happened much more slowly than it would have otherwise. When following a path of equilibria to a path of economies, one frequently has to go backwards in model time to follow the equilibria. This happened so much, I came to believe that it would be a real phenomenon. Namely, you take an economy cruising along at equilibria. The equilibrium would collide with an anti-equilibrium and poof, the local equilibrium would be gone. The model would go in dis into disarray only to reform magically somewhere else subsequently in time. I tried to convince Ken that this was a real phenomenon. I don't think I did. In any case, he said it would be difficult to prove, to which I agree. <laughs> 
I think his impossibility theorem paper was the most beautiful paper I ever read on any subject at any point in time. Somewhat related, I tried to convince him that Michel Belinsky's majority judgment voting system was the best known voting system, certainly best known to me. It has lots of wonderful characteristics. It's more natural for the voter, gets more information from the voter, gives more information to the candidate, resists extremism, resists gaming, lots of other wonderful characteristics, including picking, quote, the right candidate. I don't think I managed to convince Ken of the merits of this system either. We edited a book together called Education in a Research University with Ingram Olkin and Dick Cottle. I think it's a worthwhile volume, but in retrospect, I wish we had made a better case for education in a research university. Finally, about a month before Ken died, I had dinner with him at the V where he lived. And for every simplified political utterance I made, he had a bona fide reconsideration. What can I say? I have fond memories of Professor Arrow when he attended seminars and gave comments on my joint research with Victor Fuchs, including a year ago today, August 1st in 2016. I'm also here on behalf of another mentor, Janos Kornai, the Hungarian economist, who wrote an article in honor of Professor Arrow, published in Hungarian. Kornai writes, I first met Arrow in 1968 when he invited me to Stanford. He sought the acquaintance of researchers behind the Iron Curtain to help in influencing that part of the world. His boundless curiosity and desire to help colleagues working under difficulties were two virtues manifest in the invitation. I had brought in my suitcase a largely complete English translation of Anti-Equilibrium, which I had been working on for several years. It strove to shake the foundations of general equilibrium theory, whose main architect was the kind, friendly person who had invited me there. How would he react? He urged me to publish it, giving constructive advice and making a smiling remark that I still hear in my head. Anti-equilibrium will make a fine tombstone on the grave of general equilibrium theory. Since then, I have met legions of economists in the West and the East, but Arrow towers over the best for his generosity, open-mindedness, and encouragement of criticism. In 1972, Arrow invited me to deliver a lecture at Harvard. There, the great news broke that Arrow, in conjunction with John Hicks, had won the Nobel Prize. That evening, he invited me and other friends to supper to share his delight with modesty and no measure of falsity. The last time we met was in Budapest when he received the von Neumann Prize. His tireless mind was as fresh as ever. Those who knew Ken personally learnt with shock that this warm-hearted man was gone from us. What luckily remains for posterity is the life's work of Kenneth Arrow, one of the greatest geniuses of economics. If somebody had told me in 1970 that I'd be a friend and co-author of Ken Arrow, uh, I would have wondered what he or she had, was smoking. It seemed impossible to me. But 25 years of working together in the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics and 10 years of dining with Ken and Selma uh, in the uh, facility that we both lived in at that time uh, changed all of that. And of course, I learned that Ken was absolutely brilliant. I watched him doze through many meetings and then open his eyes and ask the critical question. A couple days before he left us, we were having a conversation and we wandered into the Plantagenet Kings, and I quickly realized that Ken knew a lot more about Plantagenet Kings than I did. And he, of course, slowly became a leader in ecological economics, partly, in, I think, because during the war, uh, he worked in the Weather Bureau, uh, in the military, uh, as a weather forecaster. Uh, so Ken is quite a sensational guy, uh, and uh, he, not young economists so much, but he, was a leader in moving economics away from the intellectual vacuums of growth mania and love of uh, efficiency and began to look at really serious topics. And one of his first efforts in that area was a paper in which he was 
the senior author alphabetically, but also included Partha Dasgupta, as I recall, and Carl Joran Mahler and Stanford's leading economist, uh, Larry Goulder, entitled, um, Are We Consuming Too Much? And it was sent to the Journal of Economic Perspectives. And there was some fuss there, but one person finally said, we've got to publish this paper by Ken Arrow and his communist friends. Well, I'm damn proud to have been one of Ken Arrow's communist friends. Uh, Ken was an amazing person and a scholar, so let me just tell you one vivid memory I have of him. That's been a brown bag lunch I gave about 10 years ago. Uh, I was talking about one of my papers about insurance, and, and Ken was on the audience, which was already a bit stressful. And then just after I finished my intro kind of setting of the modeling, he raised his hands and, and asked some, a question that seems totally sensible for any outside economics type of perspective, of asking why are people assumed to be risk averse and firms risk neutral, given that firms are ran by people. Uh, so if you are an outsider, you'd think, well, that totally makes sense. If you are an insider, you are framed in thinking for like 30 years that this is the only way to think about insurance markets. And in particular, it's shocking that it's coming from someone like Ken, who is basically the founding father, perhaps, of the insurance uh, field. Uh, and that's to me, struck me as, as an amazing, amazing kind of feeling of, of someone who basically created the field, basically led to kind of 40 years of research in, within this field, and then in a totally natural and sensible way, has no problem kind of questioning uh, some of the most basic assumptions that basically were, were given at this field for, for many years. Uh, someone who is basically always asked very sensible questions and keep thinking ahead and not worrying about his legacy or his vested interest in kind of maintaining the old framework that he helped create. Uh, so again, that's probably one of the many gazillion nice qualities and impressive qualities of humility and, and, and deep thinking that Ken had and, and we will all miss him dearly. I first met Ken back in 1950. I was an undergraduate at Stanford. The department head uh, decided that uh, it would be good to have Ken be my undergraduate advisor, which he was. He was always nice and helpful and supportive. I remember the main thing I came away from that experience was uh, that uh, I hadn't been doing enough mathematics and I'd better catch up. And in fact, someone at Stanford organized a very good two-quarter course in which we went through differential and integral calculus and matrix algebra in two quarters, but it worked. Um, then, after I graduated, the next times I saw Ken were at the Rand Corporation. I was struggling with um, a couple of mathematical papers and just not quite able to complete them, and so I took them to Ken and he was very kind and helpful, and in both cases, worked through the problem, got me to an answer, and both of them led to uh, publications in Econometrica, uh, joint articles, which was, uh, of course, really nice. Um, then I saw Ken from time to time, often in his visits to Rand when I was uh, at Rand, and um, I was, I was very grateful to him for his willingness to help me out in these mathematical papers. Then later on, when I was back at Stanford as a professor of public management in the Graduate School of Business, uh, Beverly Fuchs, I think, took the initiative and organized a book group which included uh, both arrows, Beverly and Victor Fuchs, John and Sally Fairjohn, and myself and my wife, Rosemary. It was really wonderful. We would meet about roughly maybe 10 times a year and agree on what book to, to uh, study next. Ken was just as nice as could be. Uh, if he disagreed with somebody, he didn't come out and say, I disagree with you. Rather, he would ask a pointed question that would bring you around to what he was trying to say. Uh, the remarkable thing about Ken in that experience was his memory. We'd be talking about possible books to read next, and he'd start talking about a book that he'd read in high school. 
which he could describe in considerable detail. It was an amazing feat of uh, memory by an extraordinary person. So altogether, uh, I think my life benefited greatly from my association with Ken. It was very sad in his uh, declining weeks that he couldn't speak clearly enough to articulate ideas. But um, we stayed close, close to Ken to the end. I used to run into Ken um, in the 90s when I uh, first was here. Um, he was always um, open and courteous and a real gent and always willing to talk about any, th any topic in economics. Being a development economist, I thought I would comment briefly on his main contribution to the field. Um, I guess his main contribution is uh, the welfare theorems and, and more general equilibrium theory more generally. The welfare theorems, of course, became uh, very uh, famous in the 80s uh, with the so-called Washington Consensus. And I always thought that that, that caricature of the first welfare theorem really didn't do justice of it on, on, to his work. And uh, I think that's been vindicated afterwards. After all, there was also the second welfare theorem and all his uh, cautionary words about externalities and, um, and other important topics of that kind. He also made another contribution, perhaps less, uh, less well-known outside of development economics. Um, uh, it's a 1962 paper on, on discrimination where he basically identifies uh, one uh, new source of discrimination, which he calls statistical discrimination. And this is a situation where people you know, observe a, a characteristic that people have, either a, a tenant or worker or a loan applicant and they basically infer something that they can't observe from that char observable characteristic. And that, that insight has proved extremely um, influential in development economics because a lot of uh, current um, practice is about welfare and welfare interventions, trying to help the poor, trying to help the young you know, women, uh, female entrepreneurs or, or um, minorities. And, uh, and so that, that original insight about statistical discrimination uh, still lives on as a, as a major stamp on, on that uh, targeting, you know, these issues of targeting welfare interventions. I'm Eric Hanischek. I'm a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I've known Ken for quite a number of years. My one enduring memory of Ken is his breadth and depth of interests. He seemed like he knew every f possible field. Our own research didn't really overlap. I'm interested in education policy. But every time I was in uh, the presence of Ken, he had something interesting and useful to say. I remember one time we got talking about New York City education, and he told me stories of his days as a young student in New York City. And the stories were interesting. They were useful for me because he talked about the examination systems when he was going to school and how much pressure it put on him to try to prepare for the state exams, something that's not done anymore. But the th thing that really struck me in this is that he never seemed to repeat a story. He had interesting things to say and interesting stories and interesting observations. And at least in my presence, they were always new and they were always on target. Um, I miss somebody who has that breadth of knowledge and that range of interest and the insights that I got from him. Of course, my first encounter with Ken Arrow was through his papers, which are brilliant and foundational to modern economics. But that's a point that's very obvious, so I'm not going to talk about that, but rather about how I got to know Ken and how remarkable he was as a human being as well as an economist. A number of years ago, I participated in a network on social interactions and economic inequality that was funded by the MacArthur Foundation. Ken Arrow was the head of my network. We would meet several times a year uh, over the course of several years, and the network contained social scientists from an array of different fields, economists, of course, sociologists, demographers, psychologists, um, you name it. 
uh, we were there. And we would present our research to one another and discuss that research, but we would also have very free-ranging conversations. And it was through those free-ranging conversations that I really got to know uh, Ken Arrow. And you should keep in mind that at the time, Ken was already emeritus and he was by far the oldest person in the room, but he was the liveliest and he had this enormous intellectual curiosity. He was so excited to learn the latest network theory, to learn the latest evidence on something, to learn the latest empirical techniques or econometric techniques. He was really eager to bring psychology and sociology and science into economics. Um, he was just a joy uh, to be with. And, you know, he would ask hard questions and probative questions, but he also asked questions that showed that he had a vast array of knowledge drawn from history and literature, current events, uh, you name it. He was a very broad person. And uh, finally, I think he had a kind of openness to new thoughts that I can only describe as very refreshing. During those meetings, I also grew to know Ken as a deeply ethical person whose interest in economics was highly motivated by his desire to see justice, fairness, and opportunity for all of his fellow men. And that is the quality that I admire most in Ken Arrow. So Ken Arrow taught us a lot of things, but I think one of the most important lessons was to ask a lot of questions. And when I tell my students you know, things that they should, should keep in mind, um, one of them is, is to ask questions and ask them pretty much about everything. You know, when you are thinking about being a photographer, it's, it's not just knowing how to take great pictures, but taking lots of them that counts. And, and Ken was a master at that, and uh, I think that helped in all social sciences. Um, the first time I ever saw Ken, I think, was in a conference or a, a seminar series that John Fairjohn ran. And um, in, in walked a man with a bike helmet and a bag of food and plopped down in the front and you know, started eating and asking questions. And I think by the end of the seminar, I understood more of what was going on from his questions than from the seminar itself. Um, you know, one, one of the real delights in in uh, last summer, I was at a summer school in Jerusalem, and each morning we would take a cab from the Mishkan Oshan Anim where we were staying to the university. And uh, we were with Ken, and as you went along, you know, we'd ask, talk about culture or politics or history, the religion, um, it, it, whatever the subject was, he had thought about it and, and had a lot of answers and actually more interesting questions. And he was amazingly sharp in his mid-90s. Um, I went to him, I think maybe about a year ago, asking uh, about uh, externalities. I, I was doing some research and it was pretty obvious who I should talk to. And Ken didn't disappoint. Um, in talking about how Pigou came onto the concept of externalities, he mentioned an essay by um, Alan Young. It was written in 1913 that critiqued earlier work of Pigou for not talking enough about externalities and how important they were. And then uh, a few years later, Pigou's seminal work appears. Um, and, you know, it was obvious that Ken had asked himself how this all worked out and, and had really done the digging until he found out how it all happened. Um, it was pretty impressive. Uh, I'll, I'll really miss the lunches that I had with Ken. I think, you know, he, his questions helped me a lot. Um, you know, he was always interested in how networks or uh, how understanding networks can help us in understanding inequality, polarization, um, growth, trade. It was, it was really very helpful in my own thinking, and he was, you know, always asking questions uh, and, and, you know, really trying to broaden his understanding. Um, you know, the amazing thing about Ken was he just kept going. And uh, I remember after one of our lunches, we were walking back to the department, and we got to the elevator, and he apologized for not taking the stairs. Um, he, he mentioned that, you know, just a few days earlier, he had a heart valve operation. Um, and, you know, it was just it was simply amazing. Um, so, so thank you, Ken, not only for the many lessons that you've taught us, but for the many questions that you've both asked and answered.
I first met Ken as a first year in the economics department. He had advertised for a research assistant position, and even though I was a first year, I was eager to throw my hat in the ring. It proved to be one of the most inspirational things I've ever done. Ken had me working on a project to how to figure out how to value future generations when it came to environmental policies. The first thing I noticed was that he was incredibly patient. We would often find ourselves in situations where I would be scribbling furiously trying to solve Hamiltonians on paper, which Ken had already solved in his head. This might not be surprising given who he was and who I was. But what really impressed me was not only that he was incredibly patient, but also that he was willing to listen, and often listen very carefully to the ideas and suggestions that even a first year like me had to offer. I, I think for you know, this willingness to learn from all was a trait that I really admired about Ken, and it kind of exemplified for me that being a great thinker and a great person could really be reinforcing characteristics. Um, the only time that Ken did make me feel a little bit embarrassed, embarrassed inadvertently was on one of these meetings. It was getting late and he said he had to go home because he didn't have his bike lights. He had just turned 80 that year. Um, I, in my 20s, had driven to work that day and offered to dri drive him home. He respectfully declined, but <laughs> I did feel slightly ridiculous. Um, one of the last times I met Ken was um, actually on the day of one of the pre presidential debates in this last electoral cycle. It was, of course, a, a fairly difficult time for many people, but I, he was sitting in Landau in the central waiting area reading his newspaper, and he was wearing a bright red Stanford Little Big Game t-shirt. It's one of those t-shirts that all, many of us who had gone to graduate school here had a small collection of, and seeing him wear it really lifted my spirits. And just remembering him and and, and all he did has, continues to be a great inspiration. Ken's combination of brilliance and humility was remarkable. When I first came to Stanford, I taught the first year graduate microeconomics sequence. And the high point of teaching that class every year was inviting Ken to come in and talk to the class about the history of general equilibrium theory. And Ken. First of all, he knew every detail of the intellectual history. Jevons and Valra and Marshall, Pareto, and then of course the mathematicians, Cassell and Wald and von Neumann, Kakatani. And he would explain the whole evolution of the thinking about general equilibrium theory leading up to his contributions uh, with Jard de and what was amazing about hearing Ken tell this history was, of course, his own contributions were mildly interesting, maybe the Pareto optimality uh, a little more so than the paper with Debra, and maybe the uncertainty even more so. But it wasn't really what he was interested in. What, he, what really fascinated him was the way other people had thought about the problem and the whole evolution of thinking. And he just played a small role in this evolution, although, of course, he had won the Nobel Prize for his small uh, contributing role. And... That was the way that Ken was. He, he of course, was, I'm sure he was very proud of the things he'd accomplished, and he was not shy about stating his views, but he was just fundamentally interested in listening to other people and learning from people and in understanding how they thought about things. And um, that made him incredible to be around. I feel very lucky to have been his colleague for 15 years at Stanford, um, and we miss him. Uh, hello, I would like to report on an instance of the well-known uh, generosity of Kenneth Arrow. In 1990, I was a member of the promoting group at a distance um, of uh, the Economics School of Universitat uh, Pompeu Fabra. We felt we had to launch the school in style and we needed a first-rate inaugural lecture. We asked uh, in, with characteristic short notice uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Arrow to our uh, surprise and delight, uh, he accepted. He came with uh, Selma and he uh, delivered a magnificent uh, lecture on excellence and education. It contained, for example, uh, a very early endorsement of uh, the notion of uh, income contingent returnable uh, credits for uh, university enrollment. Uh, let me add that uh, on occasion, uh, 
of this uh, lecture. We had a small lunch in a classic um, uh, Barcelona restaurant. The after lunch uh, lasted until uh, 7 uh, p.m. Uh, because uh, Kenneth engaged in an intense uh, dialogue and discussion uh, with uh, the restaurant owners himself, uh, university uh, professors, on how uh, the business, uh, his family himself, had uh, gone through uh, the years of the Spanish Civil War. This was an event that, uh, as to many in his generation, uh, it had impacted him greatly in his, uh, in his youth. Uh, he knew where he stood, he knew the whites and the blacks, uh, but he also uh, wanted to know all the greys. I'm Paul Milgram. I've been uh, Ken's colleague for uh, a couple of decades. And of course, as a graduate student, I uh, was inspired by Ken, by his depth and precision and the importance of the things he was working on. Um, but I think probably everybody has told you about Ken's scholarship and his modesty and so on. And so I thought perhaps I'd tell you about some other things that, that others might not have been able to tell you about. For example, his public service uh, in the Jewish community here at Stanford. Uh, Ken had been the, on the board and then the president of the Hillel Foundation. In fact, if you wander over to the Hillel Foundation, you'll, fi you'll find his uh, picture hanging in a gallery of, of uh, former presidents. He's uh, revered there. And, uh, and, and contributed enormously to uh, that organization. He engaged me in that and also in the fundraising for the Jewish Community Federation on campus. So that was uh, part of Ken's, uh, Ken's service to the community. Another thing that you might not have heard about was the last part of Ken's life. In fact, I visited him a, a couple of times, actually several times in the last month of his life. And the things that he was talking about then, it, it's so inspiring that even as he had difficulty speaking, what he wanted to talk about was global warming and, and treatment for malaria and income inequality. He was actually writing a paper on income inequality when he had gotten sick. Uh, he cared deeply about his community, about the people in it, about the, about the environment, and about uh, doing things about that and was so modest about himself and his, own, uh, and his own role. He just wanted to contribute. A great man, a role model for us all. Everyone understood that it was a privilege to be a student of Kenneth Arrow. There was a sense of fellowship among those of us who waited together outside his office during office hours. I uh, remember once when Ken was about to give a lecture on social choice theory, we take turns telling each other, today's the day when Arrow will prove the impossible. And I remember later when he patiently went through one sentence after another in drafts of my thesis, explaining how the deletion of superfluous clauses could actually make it readable. I was very proud when years later, he noted that my writing had improved. But most of all, he taught us by his example in upholding the highest values for an economic theorist. For Kenneth Arrow, rigorous theoretical analysis always entailed a thorough understanding of the limiting assumptions on which the conclusions were based. And when he matched this careful rigor with his genuine concern for problems in the real world, he was driven to ask about economic situations where our old assumptions did not apply. And that, I believe, is how he raised questions that led to one path-breaking advance after another in a brilliant career that will inspire us forever. As we pay tribute to Ken Arrow, I want to express a sense of gratitude for all the inspiration he has provided, uh, both through his personality and his writings. Long before I uh, ever met Ken Arrow in person, the term Arrow de Brew economy featured prominently in our undergraduate courses at the University of Bonn. Um, later, as a graduate student, I began to discover the 
uh, amazing breadth of pathbreaking work that Ken had done in so many subfields of economics, including mechanism design um, and the theory of decentralization. In the years at Stanford here, Ken was, of course, a towering figure in uh, all the seminars he attended, uh, was an amazing ability to cut to the core of an economic problem without being bothered by any of the technical clutter uh, that was around. And for me personally, um, there was a conversation Ken and I had about 10 years ago uh, where he explained to me why the problem of climate change and the transition to a clean energy economy were not only the most pressing, but also a very worthwhile field uh, for an applied theorist to get engaged in. So altogether, I'm deeply grateful to Ken Arrow for a lifetime of inspiration. So I've been at Stanford since 1980, which means that Ken and I were colleagues for 37 years. And before that, I took part in IMSSS. But the first time I met Ken was really the, the thing that stuck most in my mind. I'd been invited to a very, very distinguished conference in Israel that Ken was attending. And I was very interested in interesting him in my work. Uh, I, and uh, so when it finally came my time to, to make my presentation, which was the last of the conference, it was actually after the closing dinner with wine, uh, I, I started up and Ken rifled quickly through my part of my paper and then he went to sleep. Now, uh, I was really chagrined because he was one of my heroes and here he was sleeping through my talk before I'd barely begun. But after 20 or so minutes, when I got to the part of the paper that had caused me the most trouble, he woke up and asked me, how are you gonna deal with that? And I told him, I was shocked, but I told him and he said, oh, fine, and went back to sleep. Now I've since learned that that was Ken's normal modus operandi in seminars, but it was, uh, was quite a shocking experience for a young assistant professor. A lot of my memories of Ken and Selma, and later just Ken, were at dinner parties. And as you can imagine, Stanford dinner parties can be full of very accomplished people. But it was always my clear impression that Ken was the smartest person in the room and that he didn't notice this. And those two facts together, I think, made him very unusual. And I saw some similar aspects of Ken uh, at the summer schools in economic theory held each year, each summer, at the uh, Center for Advanced Studies at uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He would sit right up front and listen to all the lectures by all the speakers and ask penetrating questions. This is when he was well into his 90s. So he was not just a very accomplished man, but a, a very curious man who was interested in listening as, at least as much as in speaking. Ken Arrow and his work touched many different fields, including my own field, which is computer science. So why would computer scientists be interested in Arrow's work? Well, there's a number of reasons, but one of the major ones is a shared interest in the understanding of how a market reaches an equilibrium with prices such that supply equals demand. So Arrow and Debreu proved in the mid-1950s that market equilibria are guaranteed to exist under reasonable conditions, but Arrow didn't stop there, and he pushed forward with Hertz and Block to understand whether plausible dynamic processes might be guaranteed to converge to an equilibrium. That is, if we think of a market as just a really big computer, does it actually compute a market equilibrium? And if so, by what algorithm? So computer scientists are, as you can imagine, uh, highly obsessed with computation in its many forms. And so Arrow's work along these lines has inspired a rich literature in computer science on the computation of market equilibria, which remains vibrant to this day. Now, 
No one who knows Ken Arrow will be surprised to hear that when computer scientists first started showing a serious interest uh, in computation in markets, this was in the early 21st century, he received our interest with an open mind and a generous spirit. So I had the privilege of interacting with him on several occasions, most recently in the fall of 2015 when he delivered a mesmerizing kickoff lecture for a special semester I was co-organizing at the Simons Institute for Theoretical Computer Science. I have no doubt that his work and aesthetic will continue to influence computer science for many years to come. Ken, I miss you. We all miss you. You changed economics for all times. In substance and in style. I am a proud follower, curious, kind, brilliant, always interested, always interesting. My professional life was formed by study with Ken Arrow. I first met Ken in 1965, a lifetime ago. He was then, of course, Professor Arrow. I was an undergraduate at Stanford, and I took Ken's graduate advanced mathematical economics theory course. Of course, that was completely inappropriate. I had none of the prerequisites. But then Ken did not discourage me. He just gave me a daunting reading list as preparation. Studying with Ken was a view into another world where the power of mathematics was limited only by the scope of one's insight. The focus of the course was Valrhesian general equilibrium theory, uh, essentially based on Arrow and Hahn's general competitive analysis. Ken was working on the manuscript as he taught the course, and indeed, some pages of his notes, the ink was still wet from writing up uh, the text of the book. The course required a term paper. Now, in those days before the internet, having a, an advisor like Ken, who was well tuned into the field, was particularly important since he had access to all of the pre-publication written documents. So he handed me a f fistful of appropriate material to bring me up to date to the cutting edge. That term paper was my first published paper in economic theory. That full quarter of studying with Ken changed my life and gave it the direction uh, for the next half century. Ken had remarked that the mid-1960s at Stanford, in his words, appears to be a golden age. Our group of faculty and students in economic theory had an informality and collegiality. We felt ourselves a community not an oppressed minority, but rather a vanguard. We were taking over. Those were Ken's words. The mathematical, economics, and econometrics faculty and graduate students had offices in Sarah House, an amiably run-down former official residence of the president of the university. On summer Fridays, wine and cheese parties ensured a sense of collegiality though they did tend to damp productivity in the late afternoon. In 1968, Ken moved to Harvard, and a group of devoted graduate students and colleagues followed him. Ken's students owe him a debt that can never fully be repaid. He shared with us his brilliance and his enthusiasm, a passion for insight and research. We're permanently richer for the opportunity to study with and to know him. I treasure the memory and legacy of half a century of Ken's enlightening and amiable companionship. Ken and I were colleagues at Stanford for over 30 years. He's an amazing person. Of course, brilliant and productive. But he also exuded friendship and conveyed a thirst for knowledge about ideas, about the world, and about people. I recall getting a call now and then, say, hey, let's have lunch, usually at the Stanford Faculty Club. Topics varied all over the place, but frequently about macro. Ken was someone who seemed to enjoy talking about what other people were working on more than he enjoyed what he was working on. We often talked about his 1959 paper, 
towards a theory of price adjustment, uh, which influenced many people, including me. He argued that when modeling sticky prices, the monopolist to competition approach was probably not so fruitful. It was a cop-out, and I tended to agree. One of those lunches, in his capacity as editor of the Handbook of Economics, he'd asked if I'd do a handbook of macroeconomics. How could I say no? And in 1999, with Mike Woodford, we produced such a handbook. But he kept at it. Years later, he asked me to do a second handbook of macroeconomics. Again, how could I say no? This one came out just last year with Harold Ulig. Not all our talks were perfectly friendly. Sometimes we had a little confrontation now and that is understandable in the academic world. One was about an op-ed I wrote about the 2009 stimulus package. I argued it wasn't very effective. Ken disagreed. He had many suggestions of how I might fix that paper. I remember in October 2012, Ken and I had a debate. It was in a crowded Semex auditorium. It was about the 2012 election between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama. Ken was 91. He was a persuasive debater. He was filled and conveyed a great deal of wisdom about politics as well as economics. Kenneth L. is a person who first inspired me to get into economics and continue that inspiration through my entire career. I first came to Stanford as a graduate in electrical engineering from MIT. I was a PhD student in engineering economic systems department and not quite sure of my directions. I took Economics 202 from Professor Arrow. That class showed me that one could use mathematical analysis, rigorous analysis, to give insights to human choices in a market system. That analysis showed me that economics can be put on the same rigorous basis that I was used to from electrical engineering. That was the inspiration. At a later point, I became quite enamored by his book, Social Choice and Individual Values, which showed me that the same rigorous logical analysis could be used in order to understand at a deep level political choices. These two elements, analysis for market choices and market functionings and analysis for political systems have underlied much of my career to this point. Kenneth Arrow, you were my fundamental inspiration. Thank you.